welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Jen Cobray. Is anybody in the house of the Lord ready for the word of the Lord? All right. Cool. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get down on my knees and pray, and you need to stand to your feet. Thanks, Carrie. And let's go before the Lord together. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus, giving you all the praise, all the glory, all the honor. How good it is to be in the house of the Lord. And we thank you, Father, that we remind ourselves that the teacher of the church is the Holy Spirit. So welcome, Holy Spirit. Touch us, heal us, strengthen us, encourage us, guide us, guard us, direct us, and motivate us to be all the... You would have us to be, and Lord, we'll give you the praise, glory, and all the honor. We thank you, Father, for a great move of your spirit in our hearts and our lives today. But Lord, we would ask that you bless us, but we don't want you just to bless us. We want you to bless all the churches that are preaching and hearing the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, will you bless our Baptist brothers and Lutherans and Methodist Episcopalian, Charismatics and Pentecostals. Thank you for Calvary Chapels and Harvest and Oak Valley and Oasis and Inland Christian Center, the Assemblies of God, Foursquare Denomination, Lord. We thank you for our Adventist brothers and sisters and Catholic brothers and sisters. We thank you, Father, for a great move of your spirit in Trinity, Emmanuel Baptist, Ecclesia Church, Lord, the way. We thank you for San Bernardino Temple. Lord, at no time are we here thinking of ourselves as better than them, but we see ourselves Lord, as co-laborers, workers together in one field, building one kingdom, not a man's, but yours. May all the praise and glory go to you. In Jesus' mighty name, with a great big shout, we all say amen. Amen. Well, go with me, if you will, into Hebrews, the fifth chapter. We continue line upon line, precept upon precept. A lot of people don't realize that, but God wrote it that way, and you ought to be able to understand the word of the Lord that way. Line upon line, listen closely to what it does. It keeps us from just preaching the same old messages that we want to preach and that we know pretty well. And it keeps us preachers in line because we've got to minister everything, at least as much of it as we can as the Spirit of the Lord teaches us. So line upon line does something. Not only teaches you the word of God, watch this, are you listening? But it'll teach you the character, nature, and attributes of God. Because you don't want to just know the word without knowing the heart behind it. That's what this is all about. Then it gets to a place of proper evaluation. When you properly evaluate the word of God and you apply it in your life, towards your home, your marriage, your finances, dreams, vision, the destiny you have towards your children, then all of a sudden, things start to take place, life starts to change, and the blessings of the Lord are upon you. You don't get that sitting at home on the couch. You don't get that just doing something, you know, by yourself. Oftentimes, you've got to get into a place where the anointing of God is just, just first and foremost and wants to speak to you. God wants to do something great in your life today. And so as we look at the word of the Lord, I'm not going to give you the title of the message just yet. I'm going to explain a verse to you. Pastor Dan was in this verse last week. It was great. Did a phenomenal job on it. You ought to get a hold of that CD. I love the fact that we have a teaching team here, you know, and the teaching team gives us time to meditate the Word of God, gets us time to think it through, gets us time to talk to God about what we ought to be sharing with you. And we had a great and powerful teaching team here at the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. And I'm pretty excited about all the great things that are happening and what God wants to share with you today. Pastor Dan did a great job on this verse, but let's look at it together and let's see what else the Spirit of the Lord would have for us today. Are you ready? Hebrews, the fifth chapter, verse number nine. And having been perfected, he became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. I'm going to leave the verse up there because the verse says so much about you and I that we oftentimes have to look at it for just a moment. Listen closely to who he's talking about. Obviously, it's Jesus. He says, and having been perfected, Jesus, listen to this, he, notice the capital H in the word he, speaking of Jesus, 
becomes the author of eternal salvation. There's no doubt about that. If you want to get saved, the only way to get saved is Jesus' way. He becomes your Savior. He is the Messiah. He is the Son of God, the only begotten Son of God. Went to the cross, paid the price for you to have eternal salvation. Let me share this with you. Listen closely to what I'm going to say to you. This is a very serious issue. We're talking about you being saved, me being saved. There's no doubt about it that Jesus is the vehicle by which we get saved. Then he comes along and he makes this statement, the author of eternal salvation, to all who obey him. I want you to look at that just for a moment. Notice the capital H in the word him, meaning obeying Jesus. Now he says to all that obey Jesus. When I started to look at that, it was a strange thing for me. I don't know why God didn't say these words to all who believe in him. He didn't say to all who believe. We know that in order to get saved, you have to believe in him. There's no doubt about it. People have come up to you. People have come up to me over the years. Do you believe in God? Oh, yes, I believe in God. Well, then you're a believer. You're going to go to heaven. You know that. It's all about believing in God. But he doesn't say believing in God when he could have said believing in God. He says something very unusual to all that obey him. Now, can I ask you a question? Could I believe in God and not obey him and still get right with God and still go to heaven? I don't know the answer to that, but you try to figure it out today. Let's take a look at this just for a moment. Could it be, could believing in him be recognized by the obedience that we have towards him. And that's why he used the word obey. Because you know as well as I do how you get saved is believing in Jesus. You know that. I know that. So could believing in Jesus be recognized by how we obey Jesus? Let me say it one more time. Could believing in Jesus be seen by God, recognized by God, by how we obey Jesus? In other words, oftentimes we humans have cheap talk. We say things we don't really mean. We say things we don't really do. Have you ever had someone make a promise to you and you were thoroughly convinced they were going to keep the promise and they never kept the promise? All of us have. But let me tell you something. What if our words were confirmed by what we do? So when God says believing, it's not just believing with your head, but it's so believing with your heart that it produces a lifestyle that wants to do what he has to say. Mm. And that's why God puts the word obey in there instead of just the word believing. For an example, let me give you an illustration of that. If I said to you, well, did you know that I'm an artist and I paint paintings and I, have a, uh, I, I love to be an artist and I love to paint paintings. After we got to know each other a little while, you said, well, could I see one of your paintings? And I said, well, um, I don't have any. Well, if I'm an artist and paint paintings, but I don't have any paintings and never painted, am I an artist? The answer to that, of course, is obviously no. And so all of us at times need to realize that God's looking for something that's going to prove your words. And obedience, all through the scripture, is an interesting word. May I just say this to you? I'll I'll probably pick more up on this next week or the week after, but here's the deal. Obedience is so deep, it's more than just following. And it's more than just doing. Obedience is so deep to God that God looks at the heart and sees the attitude of the heart whether the person will be obedient or not obedient. 
very important for us to see. So could it be that we make statements, oh, we believe in God, don't do it. Did you know that you have people that you know in your life that say, oh, I believe in God, but have never have anything to do with God. Don't go to church, don't read their Bible, don't ever follow up, never witness for God, could care less about God, could care less about getting into church, could care, but oh, they believe in God. My question is this, do they really? Because if believing in God is proved, and by the way, that's the title of this message, the proof of our believing. If believing in God is proved by what we act like and what we do with our life, our obedience, then for some people, they're in big trouble. But I didn't write the verses. And I know it's easy for me to come in and preach some little gospel that tickles your ears and makes you feel good. Easy for me to go along with the status quo of what everybody else says to you, but I'm gonna challenge you today and yeah. where you're really at with God because a good pastor ought to do that. Yeah. A good pastor ought not to care what you think of him but care more about what you think about God. Yeah. And if you're gonna find out what's truth and what isn't truth and operate by the truth of the things of God, then let's look at the whole picture today and let's get an idea of what God wants for us. May I say it to you again? Proof of our believing is in our obedience. And that's why God used the word obedience, all eternal salvation to all who obey him. All through the scriptures, my friends. We fail to do that because we're afraid of what people might think and we're calling them to a too deep of a commitment to God that they can't keep. I say baloney to that. I say there is a commitment to God that's deep and meaningful and you can keep it by the power of the Holy Spirit that God placed on the inside of you in order for you and I to keep this and do what God would have us to do. There are three things that God gave me today quickly that I wanna go through with you in understanding, if you will, understanding about obedience. Things to understand about obedience. The first one is really interesting. We talked about it a little bit now. We're gonna amplify it a little bit more. Our actions and obedience, what we do reveals our belief. Our actions and what we do reveals, shares, shows what we really believe. Are you following me? That's really abrasive to some people because they have no actions, no activities whatsoever. But when you really love somebody, you really care to fulfill an exciting relationship with them. My wife, Deborah, just walked out and went and has a meeting between services today. But if I married Deborah, and when I first got married to her, and I said, Deborah, I really love you. I'm gonna support you, I'm gonna be there for you, I'm gonna provide for you, I'm gonna work hard for you. I'm gonna be a good man for you, I'm gonna be a man of God for you. I'll always lead you in the right direction to the best of my ability as God directs me. I just love you so much and respect you so much. Will you marry me? And she marries me. And then I never come home at night or if I'm gone for months at a time and I don't care and I'm never there, it was just a bunch of empty, shallow words. It would be horrible. Do I really love her like I said? No, because if, if I really did, I would keep my word, keep my commitment to her, and that's really what this is all about today. God wants us to see something that's very important for all of us, that our lifestyles say a lot about where we're at in belief with God. What we do oftentimes is what we believe. And if you keep doing something that's contrary to the ways of God, my goodness sakes of life, at least repent and change and get into a place where God would have you to be and work on that until you don't do it anymore. Don't allow it to continue in your life. And we love each other during the process of growth. And God would have every one of us realizing how important it is that what we do reveals where we're at. 
I want you to go with me to Luke in the 23rd chapter. It's a really interesting analogy of the word of God that we just stated in Luke, the 23rd chapter. Here we see Jesus on the cross. On one side of him is a thief. On the other side is another thief. Two thieves on the cross between Jesus and the middle. You will find some interesting commentary that's being expressed there. I'm going to read it to you and I want you to understand that one of the thieves goes to hell. The other thief goes to heaven. They were both thieves. They were both crucified. They're both about ready to die. They're both in the presence of Jesus. And something happens in one that's different than the other. Let's look at it. Verse number 39, it says this in the 23rd chapter of Luke. Then one of the criminals who were hanging, hanged blasphemed him, saying, if you are a Christ, save yourself and us. Verse number 40, but the other answered and rebuked him, saying, do you not even fear God, seeing you are under the same condemnation? Verse number 41. And we indeed justly for our re received a due reward for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, as surely as I say unto you, you will be with me in paradise. That today you will be with me in paradise. Here's one who died and went to hell. Here's one who died and went to heaven. The difference is the very expression of one man compared to the other. Let's take a look at it for an example. You might say, well, he doesn't done anything. Where's his obedience? He didn't carry out the word of God. He didn't do anything at all. How come he got to be in heaven? Let's take a look at it just for a second. Verse number 39, and one of the criminals who was hanged blasphemed him and said, you are Christ and who you, uh, save yourself and then us. Verse number 40, but the other answering rebuked him. Let me tell you something. Right there, it was a changing point of his life. This criminal could have said, hey, I don't want to get involved. Could have said, I'm not going to rebuke anybody. Who cares, man? In a few minutes, I'm going to be dead. Why do I want to be there at all? What have I got to say about this? Who am I to judge? Who am I to criticize? If the guy wants to think what he wants to think, but he doesn't, he speaks up. His actions show his belief. Is anybody listening? And he rebukes the guy who blasphemed Jesus. And then he goes on and he goes on and he continues to make some statements. He says this, do you not even fear God? In other words, man, don't you understand that you're in the presence of God? Shouldn't you at least have some respect and awe about who God is? So he's making a statement about Jesus. And then he comes along and he says, listen, verse number 41, we indeed justly have been received our due reward for our deeds, but this man is innocent. He's done nothing wrong. In other words, listen, I'm guilty and you're guilty, but this guy's not guilty. So he makes a statement about Jesus again. Remember, he could have been quiet. He could have done nothing. He could have not shown anything. He could have stayed out of it. If he had, he would have died and gone to hell. Yeah. And then he comes along in verse number 42, and he says to Jesus, Lord, remember me in your kingdom. Hey, Lord, your kingdom, Lord, what he just said is you are the king. And Jesus looks at him and says, as surely I say unto you today, you will be with me in paradise. What you do and what you don't do says where you're at with God. Let me say it again. What you do and even what you don't do says where you're at with God. And somebody needs to tell you the truth before it's too late. Are you listening? 
We see so much going on. I mean, that's a sermon in all of itself. Those verses right there, they're pretty powerful. But we're talking about things to understand about obedience. Number one, we saw the actions, belief, what we do reveals what we believe. And what we don't do reveals what we believe. Are you following me? Which brings us to number two, things to understand about our obedience. I like this one. We've touched on it a little bit, but let's define it and get a little deeper into the understanding. Deep belief calls for deep obedience. In other words, if you're going to be a deep believer, it's going to be substantiated by deep obedience. There's nobody going to come along and say, I really believe in God. I really believe in God and then do nothing about it. I really love God and do nothing about it. I'm really into God. God is so great and don't even do what he wants you to do. I mean, if I've got a deep belief in God, I will have a deep obedience to what God says. But if I have a shallow belief in God, I will have a shallow obedience level with God. And sometimes we don't want to admit it. Sometimes we don't want to see it. Sometimes we just want to be left alone. The problem today is you came into this house. And in this house, you're not going to be left alone. There's some old man preacher going to get in your face and tell you the truth. And you may not like it, but turn it around because a shallow relationship has shallow obedience and may cost you everything. And somebody needs to love you enough, respect you enough, and stop playing games, blowing smoke and lighting candles over you and throwing incense on top of you. Let me tell you something and just tell you the truth. This is the way it is. You know one thing I love about San Bernardino? San Bernardino doesn't want to mess around. They just say, listen, don't play religious games. Tell me like it is, preacher. I love that. Tell me like it is. And if you've got a shallow relationship with God, you'll do nothing with God. But if you've got a deep relationship with God, you can hardly wait to find out, get more, do more, be more, say more, see more. My goodness, come on, somebody. You know it's true. I love the words of Jesus. Don't follow me, follow Jesus. You're there in Luke anyway, 23rd chapter. Let's go to Luke 6 chapter. In Luke, the sixth chapter, let's check it out for yourself. Verse number 45. And now watch this. Remember, we're talking about a deep, a deep belief calls for deep obedience. Now watch the words of Jesus. Verse 45, a good man out of the good treasures of his heart bring forth good and an evil man out of the evil treasures of his heart brings forth evil. In other words, whatever's in your heart is what you really are believing in that produces For out of the abundance of the heart, action is expressed, or the mouth speaks. Let me say it again. Out of the abundance of the heart, action is expressed, or the mouth speaks. One more time, you missed it. Out of the abundance of the heart, if your heart is shallow, then shallow things come out of you. If your heart is deep, deep things come out of you. Are you following me? And out of the abundance of the heart, life is expressed. Wait a minute, are you following me? Are you following me? Now, with that in mind, the very next verse, watch this. 
Verse number 46. But why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not that which I say? In other words, how can I be Lord? Not one Lord, double Lord. See how easy it is for us. We can say, oh, Lord, Lord, I love the Lord. Oh, God, I love the Lord, Lord, Lord. And then he says, and do not what I say. And he didn't use just the word Lord. He said, Lord, Lord, and do not the things in which I say. In other words, obedience to his lordship shows your depth of your heart because your heart produces by expression your life according to those verses. Now watch this. In verse number 47, whoever comes to me and hears my sayings and does them, I will show you whom he is like. Now here's a guy coming to God. Here's the sayings. And does them. He says, I'll show you what he's like. Listen, listen to these words. He says, and verse number 48, and he is like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock. We're not talking about the church. We're talking about Jesus, the rock. And you know, you have a picture right there of a man building a house and digging a foundation real deep, going into the soil. That's not what he's really talking about. He's really talking about back to the subject, the heart. The man who digs deep the foundations in your heart and places them on Jesus. Digs deep and lays that foundation on Jesus. And when the floods arose and the, and the, and the streams beat vehemently against the house, it, it should not shake it. And it was found because it was founded on the rock, on Jesus. Verse number 49 comes along and says, but he who heard and did nothing is like a man who built his house on the earth and without a foundation against which when the streams beat vehemently uh, against immediately it fell and the ruin of the house was great. For all of us that are in here, listen, 2013 can be the greatest year of your life or the worst year of your life. If you don't hear anything else, hear that. 2000, are you awake? 2013 can be the greatest year of your life or the worst year of your life. And it all is not on God like we think it is. It's on you. God reacts to you and as you react to him. He says, draw near to me and I'll draw near to you. First action is yours, draw near to him. And today here we're just looking at our lives and saying, you know, if I'm called to a deep position with God, it's going to take deep obedience for me to get in there. Because what I do determines who I am and says what I am. Because out of the abundance of the heart, my life expresses does it express good things out of the treasures of a good man's heart? Or does it express the junk of the world? Is anybody listening? So powerful for us to see. Third thing, we're looking at things to understand about obedience. And I like this one. Third thing to understand this morning is obedience brings eternal rewards. We have a lot of things we put a lot of emphasis on, my friends. We put an emphasis on our houses and our cars, and rightfully you should. We put an emphasis on our job and our children, and rightfully you should, and it's okay. We Americans put a lot of emphasis on vacations, where we go, what we do, and how we do it, and that's okay. God's not against any of that. But I want you to know something. Whatever it is that you will obtain on this earth, you will not take with you. No matter how much money you have, you will never fill that coffin up with that money. The only thing it'll do is bless everybody that's behind you that can hardly wait for you to drop dead in order for you to get it, they to get it. And I want you to know something, after two or three generations, nobody remembers you anyway. 
They don't know who you were, what your name was, what your maiden name was, don't know anything about you, don't care to find out anything about you. May I say this to you? You don't know who your great-great-grandparents were. You don't know where they came from. You don't know their back names. What makes you think people are going to remember you? They're not. The only thing you're going to take with you is what's eternal. And you develop what's eternal in the rewards that are waiting for you right here with the things of God. Believing God and being obedient to God brings eternal reward. Somebody ought to say amen. Now let me take you, if I may, and confirm that because this is a fascinating verse. Last verse, uh, last chapter in the book of Revelation, chapter 22. Go with me. Let's just pop it up on the overhead. Listen to this. Blessed are those who believe in the commandments. Does your Bible say that? What, we got three people out there this morning? Let's try to wake up, come on. <laughs> Blessed are those who believe in the commandments. Does it say that? Now look, can I just confirm that with you? When the New Testament talks about commandments, you're not talking about 10 commandments. Stop being childish in your theology and understanding. We're not talking about Ten Commandments. We're talking about everything the New Testament and the epistles talk about. All the things that God would have us to do and how to live life. That's the commandments, the words of Jesus. We're not talking about the Ten Commandments. So here the verse comes along, makes a statement. Blessed are those who believe. No, it doesn't say believe at all. Blessed are those who, what? Do. do. Blessed are those that do what? Do. One more time. Blessed are those who, what? Do. And then it comes along and it makes a brilliant statement. Can I tell you the statement? Watch this statement. This, this will make your tongue jump out of your head and slap your brain. He <laughs> says this, that they may have the right to the tree of life. You ought to circle that in your Bible. That they may have the right to the tree of life. Let me say it one more time. That they may have the right to the tree of life. Back in Genesis, the third chapter, I think it's verse 23 and 24, we find Adam and Eve that have fallen and separated from God in the third chapter. One of the first things God does after talking to Adam and Eve is he drives Adam and Eve out of the garden and takes a angel with a flaming sword to protect the tree of life. Because anyone who partook and ate of the tree of life has eternal life. Now watch this. Has eternal life if they ate of the tree of life. If they ate of the tree of life in a fallen, separated state from God, they would live forever in a separated, fallen state from God. So God drives them from the garden, takes an angel, places them around the tree of life with a flaming sword that anything that comes near the tree of life to eat the tree of life doesn't eat, partake, and live forever. Wow. Then in the end of the book, now who has the right to the tree of life to partake and eat forever? Those that do <laughs> the commandments of the Lord and may enter through the gate unto the city. I mean, that's a bizarre statement, my friends. Now look, let's understand each other today. I love you enough to not mess with you. I love you enough to tell you the truth. I love you enough to put everything on the line for your soul. Because I could play games just like you've had games played all of your life. I could be the religious person that you walk out of here and say, oh, isn't he sweet and isn't he nice? Whoa, that was great. And then you die and you go to hell and you've missed God completely. Wouldn't that be sad? Or you can have somebody who loves you enough to fight for you right now. The proof of your believing 
is what you do with what you have from God. You say, wait a minute, Pastor. What about grace? What about it? What about it? You got saved because of the grace of God and faith in God, believing in God. What has that got to do with anything? Did you know that if you don't do what God has you to do because you have the grace of God on you, you frustrate the grace, the Bible says, of the grace of God? Paul writes and makes this statement, shall I continue sinning that grace may abound? How about if you really are a believer, you really are saved, you really are a Christian, then how about finding out what is the will of God and doing it no matter what your flesh says or any of your buddies or friends say? And that means a commitment on your part. That's why I said that 2013 could either be the best year of your life or the worst year of your life. Now, some of you don't like it because I've rubbed you the wrong way. It's like stroking a cat. You can stroke him the right way. but you stroke him the wrong way, man, his hair gets all out of place. Can I tell you something? Turn the cat around because I'm telling you the truth. And today... Your obedience to the things of God, your commitment to God is proved by what you do. Out of the abundance, the life speaks or the mouth speaks and does what you would say. If God spoke to you today, come on, give the Lord a great big praise. Thank you, Jesus. I want to make sure that everybody's all right with God before you go. Listen to me, you don't get to heaven. You hear me now? And thank you for not getting up. I saw a few sneak out when my head was down. They said, let's go, let's go. And they ran out real quick. And they ran out away from Lionel too. And so uh, I, I, I appreciate you not getting up. But I want you to know something. Nothing could be sadder than you coming in the house of God, hearing the word of the Lord. And then walking out of this place, your heart stops and you die and you go to hell. You don't get to heaven by coming to this church. You don't get to heaven your way, my way. You don't get to heaven some well-meaning church committee's way. You get to heaven Jesus' way. Jesus made a statement, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man goes to the Father except by me. You can't get there any other way. Then he tells us in the scripture how to get to heaven. Now listen, ask yourself this question. If you died in the next few minutes, would you go to heaven? Then ask yourself, what makes you think you would? Let's talk about your answer. Some of you said, well, I'm a pretty good person. I'd go to heaven because I'm good. Did you know that nowhere in the scripture does it say you get to go to heaven because you're good? Nowhere. You're not going to make it. Someone needs to tell you. Did you know that some of you might have answered, well, I hope that if I died, I'd go to heaven. That was your answer. Can I tell you something? Nowhere in the Bible say, because you hope you get to go to heaven. You're not going to make it. Somebody needs to tell you. Some of you might have said to yourself, well, Pastor Jim, I love God a lot. I'm going to go to heaven because I love God. Guess what? Nowhere in the Bible to say you get to go to heaven because you say you love God. It's not in the Bible. You're not going to make it. And somebody needs to tell you. You know, some of you might say to me, Pastor Jim, you don't understand. My mom, my dad told me I was a Christian when I was a kid. They had me christened or baptized when I was a baby. Took me to catechism class or Sunday school or Sabbath school class when I was a child. You know, I went through all those classes. But I want you to know something. That's great that your parents did that. But did you know there's nowhere in the Bible that says because your mom and dad did that, get you to go to heaven because you've been christened or baptized. Put a cross, St. Christopher, around your neck as a child. Nowhere. You're not going to make it. If you think that's going to get you into heaven. You know, a lot of times we think we know Jesus because we celebrate Christmas and Easter. And I know you know who Jesus is. There's no doubt about it or you wouldn't be in this building. You even heard his words today. You know who Jesus is. You know about the resurrection at Easter. You know about the baby in the manger at Christmas. There's no doubt about it. But can I say something? Look at me now. Watch this. 
It's not about what you have in your head. It's about what you've done in your heart. Have you given God all of your heart? Have you given God all of your life? It's an all or nothing relationship, he tells us in the scripture. In John, the third chapter, Jesus tells us exactly how to get to heaven. He comes to a guy by the name of Nicodemus. Nicodemus, in his lifestyle, was probably better than all of us. You see, this guy was a keeper of the law, memorized the scripture, quoted the scripture, debated the scripture, sang the scripture. Oh, this guy Nicodemus, what a good guy. Fed people in his church, the synagogue, was a leader in his church, the synagogue. I would have thought, wouldn't you, that Jesus would have patted him on the back and said, good job, Nicodemus, you're going to love heaven, and heaven's waiting for you, but he doesn't. He comes to Nicodemus and he says, Nicodemus, even though you've done all these great things, you must be born again. When I use the words born again, did you know that most people in American churches don't really even know what born again means? And they truly, most people turn off at those words born again. You know why you turn off? Because Hollywood portrays born again people like idiots, like fools, radicals, and fanatics. And that's not what I'm talking about, nor is it what Jesus is talking about. By the way, Hollywood has no concept on how to get to heaven. Most of them, if they don't change and repent, will be in hell. I promise you that. And I want you to know something. You don't want to listen to Hollywood on trying to figure out how to get to heaven. You need to look at the scripture. And Jesus tells us exactly, you must be born again. The problem with it is, is you may not know what it means. So let me tell you what born again means from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible. It means this that you have given God all of your heart. You have given God all of your life. Listen to what I'm gonna to say to you. It's an all or nothing relationship with Jesus Christ. God forgive us in American churches for 250 years. We've watered that down, but I want you to know something. It's an all or nothing relationship and somebody needs to love you enough, respect you enough, honor you enough to tell you the truth. It's all or nothing. And I'll prove it to you by the scripture. Last book in the Bible, the book of Revelation, you know you've heard about it. Jesus is speaking. He says, I'm coming again. And when I come, I better find you hot or I better find you cold. Because if I find you lukewarm, I will vomit you from my mouth. What a crude and rude statement Jesus himself makes. But can I say this to you? Listen to this. Here's what he really said. He really said people who call themselves Christians that are lukewarm are not real Christians at all and they're going to get vomited from the mouth of Jesus. Some of you have been lukewarm. Let's define for you what lukewarm means. Lukewarm means little in, little out, little up, little down, token prayer, occasional church attendance. You know, you're not against God, but you're not wholehearted for God. God is something in your life. Here's lukewarm. He's something in your life, but he's not everything. Did you know that he'll never be something until you make him everything? God's in this house calling you home. Today is your day to surrender all of your heart. Give God all of your life. It's a divine appointment you have with God. You've had a lot of appointments in your life. Doctors, attorneys, painters, and plumbers. But I'm here to tell you today, Today, God brought you here for a reason, to give you the truth and to let you know that today you can get right with God in this house. Today is your day of salvation. Hear what I'm going to say to you right now. Very important. You say, Pastor Jim, how do I get right with God? Let's don't do it your way. Let's don't do it my way. Let's do it Jesus' way. Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. But if you deny me, I'll deny you. In a moment, I'll count to three. I'll go like this. One, two, and then I'll say three and pop my hands together. It'll sound like this. Three, bang. When you hear that sound, bang, your hand goes up. I'll see your hand go up all over this auditorium, back in the family room, in the foyer by television, down at the Love Rock Cafe, down at Kuka's Cafe. I'm here talking to you right now. Put the burrito down. I want you to hear what I'm saying and get right with God. Today is your day of salvation. And you raise your hand, and God will see you all across this auditorium. Who should raise their hand if you've been running from God instead of to God? I'm speaking to you. If you've never given him all of your heart, 
I'm speaking to you. If you're one of those people that are in here and you've never given him all of your life, I'm speaking to you. Get ready to put your hand up. If you're never giving him all of your heart, never giving him all of your life, or you're just not sure where you're at with God, you've known him in your life, all of your, in your head all of your life, but so has the devil known him all these years too, and he's not saved going to heaven. So it's not about head knowledge. You need to get right with God. Even if you make sure, if you're wondering whether or not it's you, get ready to put your hand up. All across this auditorium, I've done my job. I've told you the truth. I'm in your face, you bet. But today is a good day because today is your harvest day. I'm counting to three, pop my hands together. As you hear my hands pop, you get your hand up all over this place, even in the family rooms, even in the foyer. The ushers will see you. Ready? Here it is. One, two, three. Let me see your hands. Let me see your hands. There's one, two, three, four, five, six. Thank you. Seven. Back up on top. Let me see your hands. Eight. Back over here. Thank you. Anybody else? Back over here. Thank you. There's nine. Back over here. There's 10, 11, 12. Thank you. Back on this side, I see those up there, 12, 13, God bless you, back over here. There's 14, 15, 16, 17, back here. There's 18, 19, 20, thank you, in the family room. Anybody else, there's 21 right here, God bless you. And then there's 22 right back over here, thank you. God bless you, gotcha, 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 you can put a hand down. 22 people, wise people. Anybody else, real quick. Anybody else before we turn? Another person back here, 20, where are you? They're, they're pointing this way, you're pointing, this way, this way. Am I looking the right way? No, tw- this more this way? My goodness, 23, 24, I already got them. Yeah, got them, got them, 23. Anybody else? Anybody else, anybody else? Well, let's give the Lord a great big praise for 23 wise people. <laughs> praise God. Here's what we want to do. All 23 of you, I don't want anybody to leave, get up and walk out. This is a rude time to do that. Give these people just a few more minutes. And listen, here's what I want you, all 23 of you that raised your hand and anybody that should have raised your hand but you didn't. I want you to get a hold of your coat, purse, sweater, Bible, friend, get your stuff, get your stuff, bring a friend, get in the aisle, meet me in front. Remember, no one leaves during this period of time. If you didn't raise your hand, but you should have, you come too. Just get out of your seat. Check with your neighbor. Say, come on, I'll go with you. And get out of your seat. Meet me right here in front. Let's welcome them as they come. Come on, let's welcome them. You come now. Come. Come on home. Home. Oh, they're coming. Give them a hand as they come. Help me know you are near. You're all I want. Oh, they're coming. Give them a hand as they come. Come on, you come too. Thank God you've all come. I want you to look to your left. See this guy waving at you? His name is Pastor Joel. Joel is a great guy. Just takes a few minutes. He's going to do three things. Let me tell you what they are so you're not afraid because nothing weird's going on. Three things are this. Number one, you need to pray and invite Jesus in. He doesn't come in because you came forward to raise your hand. He doesn't come into your heart because you need him. He went to the cross and died for you because you need him. He's a gentleman and you need to invite him in. He'll pray with you a prayer that you can repeat to invite Jesus in your heart. Number two, he's going to give you some free information that tells you what to do next. In other words, now that you're a Christian, now that you're saved, going to heaven, we want to make sure that you know what God would have you to do next now that you're a Christian, okay? So simple, easy reading. Number three, he's going to introduce you to a program that we have called Spiritual Personal Trainers. Those are friends. People that'll meet you before church service, buy you coffee, tea, nachos, cookies, donuts, lobster, steak, whatever you want. We'll get you, we can get you back to church. We'll give you anything you want. But because we care about you so much, we don't want you to fall through the cracks. That's very important that you not fall through the cracks, that you emotionally come forward today and then go back. So we want to fight for your soul. We want to help you meet with your spiritual personal trainer 
He'll help you right before church service by getting here early. I'll explain the whole program. And then guess what? You'll be strong in the ways of the Lord. Let me just make this statement to you. If you give God, remember you're going to give him all of your heart and life anyway. That's why you came up here. But if you give God one year of your life, he will give back to you the rest of your life completely blessed in every area, home, family, finances, dream, vision, destiny, purpose, everything. But you're going to have to give God something, all of your heart, all of your life today. That's what you're doing. And then watch God. So give us a year. You say, well, I have another church I go to. I'm glad you do, do. But can I say this to you? You didn't get saved there. God spoke to you here. God got you saved here. This ought to be a church for you that's going to, God's going to continue speaking to you. So let me tell you this to you. God wants to do great things in your future. Give us that year and watch God do something wonderful. Make a left turn, if you will. Follow Pastor Joel right over there. Come on, let's give the Lord a, a great big praise.